before I begin this morning, there's two things I'd like, I'd like to say. First of all, the subject matter that I'm going to be addressing this morning and next week, if you were to have five guys, two guys on each side of me this morning, pastors, teachers, whomever, and we were to all address the same subject matter, you would get five different opinions. You get five different views, five different assessments. Of, of the subject matter. And uh, I'm just one. I'm just one. And the second thing I, I want to say to you is that because you come from such a broad spectrum of backgrounds in this congregation, as I said to you when I began in some congregations, some denominations, some Bible study groups, the Holy Spirit is, is spoken about a great deal. And then in others, he is rarely mentioned for a variety of reasons. And I have been addressing the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives now for four or five, maybe six weeks, and this week and tomorrow. I hope at no point have you ever gotten the idea that I am questioning and challenging in any way your view of the Holy Spirit or, of, or your experience with regards to the Holy Spirit in your life. That has never been and that is not my intent under any circumstances. Our relationship with God is a personal relationship with God. And we all grow and mature and learn at different rates and at different, shall I say, speeds. And so it has never been my intent to suggest that if you do not see things my way or you are not experiencing what I or someone else has done, that you are less Less, uh, less of a Christian or less mature. That is not my intent at, at all. So I hope you understand that. <coughs> <coughs> to set the stage for the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians and Paul's instructions relative to spiritual gifts, I think it's maybe helpful if I take a few moments and, and give you the background the, the background of Paul's reasoning and the background of the church that he wrote to. As you probably know, the city of Corinth, the ancient city of Corinth, is located in what is now modern-day Greece. Uh, Corinth was a city, a, a commercial city. They were makers of purple. They, they made linen or cloth. They made uh, manufactured pottery and armor. It was a city that was, that was luxurious and yet licentious. Luxurious and licentious. It was a city of such immoral lifestyle that it led to the, to the verb to Corinthianize. Immorality and idolatry were the norm in the city of Corinth. The Apostle Paul arrived in the city in approximately AD 52. And he labored there for 18 months. Uh, probably he was staying in the home of Priscilla and Aquila, and there the church was established in their home. And Paul worked as a tent maker during those 18 months to support himself. Approximately four years later, Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthian church. He wrote it uh, to, to deal with issues that he heard was surfacing. And when Paul left, there was a man by the name of Apollos that took up his role as leader of the church. The church in Corinth was not a church like this, as you well know. It was how they met in homes and houses. And so they were small groups. And as the church grew, and it did grow uh, after Paul left, but it was a very troubled group of people, a, tr a, a group of people loosely affiliated with one another. And it's generally accepted in, in theological studies that Paul uh, made a brief unrecorded, other than in the second chapter of 2 Corinthians, he made an un, unrecorded visit to the Corinthians because there was some need for church discipline at that time. And it is referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and chapter 13 as the painful visit. The painful visit. He was not happy to have to have gone there. And in his letter, Paul addressed the issues that, that, he, that, came, that he became aware of that was happening in this congregation. 
there was great division. None of us here would have wanted to have been a, a member of the church at Corinth. I've heard pastors say, I want a New Testament church. Well, I don't want a New Testament church because the New Testament churches as they, as they originated were troubled churches, great divisions within the congregation. There was jealousy, Paul said. There was quarreling going on. A, there was disagreement among them as to the need for or the appropriateness for Christians to marry. There was arguments over food that had been offered to idols. They, when food was offered to idols, it was then taken to the meat market, sold. There was a great dis disagreement among some of the members of that congregate of the smaller congregations. Should we eat that meat or not? And so there, there was disagreements over that. There was disagreements in the congregation of the role of women in the church. And in some churches, we still have that problem. There was, there was disagreements as to how they were to dress. Were they to wear makeup? Were they to wear jewelry? That were they to have their hair long or short? Even there was disagreements over the length of a man's hair. And, and it may be hard to accept, but there was disagreement and disbelief by some of, about the resurrection of the dead, which would in fact bring into question the resurrection of Jesus Christ without which we would not be saved. And then one of the, one of the more glaring uh, problems in the church was recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There was a man there who had taken his father's wife, his stepmother, to be his own. And to compound that problem, there were members of the church who were proud of their tolerance. Well, now, in partial de uh, uh, defense of the Corinthians, let me say to you that they were a group of people who had come from lifelong idolatry and immorality. And when they were introduced to Christianity by the Apostle Paul, and, and, and they did not have the benefits of this book of the Bible. They did not have the benefit of a cadre of mature Christians whom they could emulate and, and, and copy the way they lived. And so they, falling back into the old habits was very easy for these people. In fact, at one point, Paul sent his young protege, Timothy, to exercise church discipline among them, but apparently Timothy failed at his efforts. So the question that, that rises as I, as I point all these negatives out, the question that's probably come to your mind, with all of those problems, with, 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 the, with the claim of those people to have accepted Christ and, and to have changed their lives and to have been transformed by their faith in Jesus Christ, how in the world could all of those problems exist in their midst and how, more importantly, could the Apostle Paul begin to talk to them about spiritual gifts in their midst? And yet, that's exactly what he did. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians are to be viewed as one section of Paul's letter. They all speak, all three of them speak of the, and they address the issue of spiritual gifts, of the origins of the gifts, and of the use of the gifts in the spirit. And, and to read them, to just take out little sections of, of those three chapters and read them and try to apply them, you don't get a full picture of what Paul is trying to say to this church. He's trying to bring them into conformity to biblical, what would be biblical doctrine. And as you are glad to hear, I'm not going to address all three chapters this morning. Uh, it'll, it'll take some time. But anyway, so we don't have, do we have the, the can you put the, the verses of scripture up there that I can refer them to them? I should have said that to you. Now about spiritual gifts. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> Chapter 12, verse 1. Paul says, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. Now for those Corinthians, that must have seemed like a slap in the face. Because they viewed themselves as extremely uh, uh, well-versed and experienced in spiritual gifts. Especially the gifts of tongues and interpretation. Paul said, I won't, don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, about the spiritual gifts. And in verse 2 and 3, as you read it, you know that when you were pagan somehow and other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Paul is assuming here that he is writing to a Gentile congregation. He is assuming that he is writing to people who have been led astray and, and, and have been and have been have worshipped the idols that were so prevalent in that day. No one, he says, can say that Jesus is Lord. No one will curse Jesus if it, 
Let me read it to you. No one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, he's assuming that he's dealing with, with, with Gentiles. The Jews, they were, they were having problems with Jesus, as it were, as it was. But not to curse him, as some event had evidently done. In pagan worship, as many of you probably know, in pagan worship, there's a lot of ecstatic utterances that are brought on by evil spirits and are brought on by intoxicants. The American Indians, some of the American Indians, as you have probably read, use a, 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 a plant called peyote, which gives, gives them hallucinations. So it was not uncommon in the pagan world for them to have all kinds of ecstatic utterances. And Paul says, you can't curse Jesus and be led of the Spirit. And apparently, some have done exactly that. So what he's emphasizing is the genuine need of the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives for us to be able to say Jesus is Lord. And his point is, it takes the prompting of the Spirit of God. It takes the prompting of the Spirit of God for us not only to acknowledge Jesus as our Lord, but for that acknowledgement, that confession to affect the result necessary to say Jesus is Lord, to have him indeed be Lord and Master of our life. In chapter, in verses four and five, the Apostle Paul begins to list and, and to lay out the numbers of a, a number of uh, uh, spiritual manifestations that he wants to speak of, and it's not it's not a complete list. There's others in, that to be found in the scriptures, but the important part of verses four, five, and six is the is the implicit trinitarianism of it. Listen to what it says, and go back to verse four. There are different kinds of gifts and the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And there are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in all men. So Paul has indicated here that it is God who in, is involved in, it, in distributing the works of the Holy Spirit. It is God that, that is, is ministering in spiritual manners and in spiritual activities. And it was, I think, his effort to try to counter what was a tendency on the part of the Corinthians to focus on just one or two of the spiritual gifts. Paul wants them to know that it is God who demonstrates, it is God who distributes, and it is God who is in charge of spiritual giftedness. The individual believer is not the source of spiritual gifts. And in verse 7 it tells us that spiritual gifts are not primarily, primarily for the believer's own edification, but for the common good. The common good. And now, he says, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. He begins this, this whole process of letting them know that God is in charge and not they. They are not in charge of the process, but it, but it is God. And I'm, I'm, of the, I'm of the opinion, personally, and with $4, what does Starbucks cost now? With four dollars, and you can buy. A, in my opinion, you can buy a cup of Starbucks coffee. But it is my personal opinion, and you don't, you don't take it for what it's worth. It's my personal opinion that every born again Christian is is spiritually gifted for the common good of the local church. And that may be news to all of you, or some of you. But every born again believer, I believe, is spiritually gifted. Now, it has not been my experience in my many years as a pastor. It has not been my experience that every gift is demonstrated and exhibited in every congregation at all times, and it is not at every service that the gifts of the Spirit are manifested. Can I say that again? Not at every service and not in every church are all of the gifts of the Spirit manifest. It's my personal op uh, opinion that the gifts are demonstrated as needed for the common good. And it is the Holy Spirit who initiates them, not we ourselves. Verse 8 says, To one there is the gift through the Spirit, the message of wisdom. I went to Webster's Dictionary and I, I read that wisdom in the dictionary is good judgment or common sense. And I went to a couple of Bible commentaries and I got the idea that wisdom as understood in the, in the New Testament is a deeper insight or understanding of an issue. A deeper insight or understanding of, of an issue. The exercise of the gift of, gift of wisdom is for the benefit of the church, the benefit of the body of Christ. 
And not at all times are you going to see that exhibited. But in times of need, in times when good counsel is necessary, when someone needs good advice, it is by the Spirit of God quite often that we get a deeper understanding of the need of the church or of the advice that we need. And you undoubtedly can think of times when someone has given you good advice and you thought, well, that was fine, but they could very well have been an exercise of the Spirit of God through that individual giving you the good advice. The effort of the Spirit to minister to us is for the common good so that we can better minister to one another and to those around us. Because we are, I'm limited in what I can do and I'm sure you would acknowledge you're limited in what you can do. But by the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, we can touch lives and we can see changes in people's lives because of the work of the Holy Spirit for the common good in our body. In verse 8, to another, the message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. Now, it's interesting, the wording of that phrase has led some people to believe, some people to contend that the word of knowledge refers to knowing a mystery that no one else knows. That's how they've interpreted, that's how they've translated. But I, I ran across a writer who said this, and I think he hit the nail on the head. He said that the gift of knowledge states the facts. The gift of wisdom shows how to understand and apply the facts. And it seems to me that is, that is a, a, a good a, a, a illustration or explanation. The gift of knowledge states the facts. The gift of wisdom shows how to understand and apply the facts. Knowledge usually comes through study and through research. But when it is used by the workings of the Holy Spirit, it is for the common good that someone comes up with by the means of the Spirit an understanding of a situation better than perhaps we have. But in verse 9, it simply says, to another faith. Now, all Christians have faith. The scripture says it's impossible to please God without faith. Without faith, none of us came to faith in Jesus Christ. None of us trusted him if we had not had faith. Without faith, we cannot be saved. The scripture tells us that that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we all have faith. But I think the gift of, of faith is the unquestioned belief in and trust in God to answer prayer, to meet needs, and even to heal the afflicted. To genuinely, deeply trust God. The scripture says that it is the hearing of the word of God that creates faith. And I'm, I'm convinced that the gift of faith is deeply rooted in knowing and trusting God's word. One of the reasons we don't see more of that demonstrated in America is that people have come to the point where we didn't either know nor trust God like we, like we used to or should. That's an editorial comment, by the way. And because the Holy Spirit abides with us and indwells us and is to influence us our daily lives, those gifts, the gifts of service and ministry and knowledge and all of those, those are viewed in, in many instances as the natural characteristic of an individual. We see someone who is, who is always helpful, and I could name two or three in this congregation. Always helpful, and we think, boy, isn't that nice? That's just sort of part of their, their character and their nature. I would suggest to you that it could very well be the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives, that they have the energy and the time and the willingness to serve and to, and, and to minister. When someone in our congregation has wise counsel, when someone has, is able to share from the God's word insight that we didn't quite... Have you, have you ever had the occasion that you read a passage of scripture that was very familiar to you and all of a sudden you had a new insight to it? So I didn't see it that way before. Could it not be the Holy Spirit in illuminating your heart so that you know and you understand that passage in a, in, in a new way? I firmly believe that to be true. And there's not a pastor that's worth his salt that would not acknowledge to you that while in the midst of bringing a sermon that the Holy Spirit did not bring to his mind illustrations, passages of scripture, insight into the passage that he had not thought of at all during his study to bring it for the common good. I know that's happened to me on many occasions. And then there's one last thing that I want to I say. And that's this. Nowhere in the scripture 
Nowhere in the scripture does it tell us that those who are used of the Holy Spirit that are, that are, that are ministering a spiritual gift, nowhere does it say that we are, we are to hold that person up as a special individual in the congregation. Nowhere are we to credit that individual with, with, with credit for what they're doing. All of the ministry that we see done by means of the Holy Spirit, God should get the credit for it. God should get the credit, whether you're serving or you're, or you're, or you're administering, whether you have, you're exercising wisdom or knowledge or faith or prayer, whatever, God should get the glory. Never should we take honor and glory for what God is doing in our midst. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. So I don't know how confused I've confused you this morning. But it is not my intent. God wants to minister to you and through you in this church and in this community. He wants to work through every born again, every born again believer in every congregation. And every congregation has need of the gifts of the spirit to be operative, to encourage, to bless, to minister, to uplift. To reach out and touch others, to be able to know what is the right thing to do. What should we, should we, you know, should we take this step? Should we do that? It takes the leadership. If we ask for the leadership of the Holy Spirit, He will give us wise counsel from those within the body of Christ. Not because they're so smart, but because the Spirit of God is using them. I've seen that time and time and time again. Next week, I want to address the more obvious gifts. And, uh, and yet they're the most controversial. And they're controversial, at least in my view, because man's pride is able to get involved and, and to distort and, and to subvert them. And so if I haven't scared you off, I hope that you'll come next week. And we'll look at the remaining passage of scripture and the remaining gifts that Paul speaks of. Father. I know that what I've said this morning may be a little strange to some, and I apologize for that. But I, I deeply, deeply, deeply am grateful for your work in our midst, and, I, and I, want us, I want us to be more aware of and sensitive to things that we can be used in your, in your kingdom. We are in a mission field, and, and there are people who need to be blessed and ministered to. And because of our age and health and other issues, we're not always able to do what we might like to, but you can enable us, you can empower us to do what we could not do in our own strength. We can speak words of courage. We can speak words of encouragement to bless people in your name and what a joy and what a blessing that is speak to our hearts let us be used of you I pray in the precious name of Christ my Lord amen would you stand and let us sing together where the spirit of the Lord is there is strength there is love and